divide the people, split them into quarreling factions, fighting among themselves rather than their common enemy. This is the comrade's first rule for the conquest of any country. For well do they know from long experience that the nation so divided and weakened can be easily conquered from within. The communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can only be attained by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. The most powerful enemy can be conquered only by exerting the utmost effort and by thoroughly, carefully, attentively and skillfully taking advantage of even the smallest rift, of every antagonism of interest among the various groups or types within the various countries. With phase one, that of dividing the population, completed, the revolutionists were ready to move into phase two of the communist blueprint for takeover. Create the appearance of popular support. In every country now part of the Red Slave Empire, the actual number of Communist Party members at the time of takeover has been less than 1% of the total population. As Lenin phrased it, Communism must be built with non-communist hands. By cleverly beguiling thousands of well-intentioned people into unwittingly supporting the revolutionary program, the dedicated 1% can trick the 90 and 9% into surrendering their birthright. This they do by hiding the true communist objectives behind appealing slogans and pretended humanitarian goals. As Stalin explained, the revolutionary accepts reform in order to use it as a cover for his illegal work. After the communists have found some issue or point of difference upon which they can divide the people, get them fighting among themselves rather than their common enemy, the next step is to create the appearance of popular support for the communists' war of national liberation. They have been devastatingly successful thus far. Yet in one country after another, there have been alert, informed individuals who saw the signs, recognized the patterns of conquest, and raised their voices to warn the people. Against just such a contingency, the communists developed the third phase of their blueprint for world domination. Neutralize the opposition. We can and must write in a language which sows among the masses hate, revulsion, and scorn toward those who disagree with us. A Communist Party directive issued in 1943 reads, Members and front organizations must continually embarrass, discredit, and degrade our critics. When obstructionists become too irritating, label them as fascist or Nazi or anti-Semitic. Constantly associate those who oppose us with those names which already have a bad smell. The association will, after enough repetition, become fact in the public mind. The next step in the communist strategy is the most easily recognized, for it consists of the tactic of getting masses into motion, and thus precipitating mob violence. Master psychologists that they are, the communists know that once the masses are in the streets, it's not too difficult to convert an orderly demonstration into a full-scale riot. They know, too, that when rioting occurs, police and military forces of the government must move to restore law and order, and thus they have the first visible signs of revolution. Riots, demonstrations, street battles, detachments of a revolutionary army, such are the stages in the development of the popular uprising. The official constitution and program of the Communist Party stated in 1921, The Communist Party will educate and organize the working masses for mass strikes and mass demonstrations. It is through struggles that the working masses are prepared for the final conflict for power. As these strikes grow in number and intensity, they acquire political character through unavoidable collision and open combat with the capitalistic state. Mass action culminates in insurrection and civil war. In 1964, a communist document taken from the Viet Cong stated, Get the people out into the streets. Quarrels should be provoked. 
Youth groups are to be armed with knives and clubs, allegedly to protect themselves in a manufactured tension. In China, as in all countries, the communist appeal was aimed primarily at students, young, idealistic intellectuals, most of whom came from wealthy families who could afford to send them to school. It was from this group that the young communist recruits came who later provided the leadership and backbone for the armed conflict to follow. In Cuba, leftist-oriented students were the vanguard of the organized street demonstrations. Once the masses were in motion, that tenuous line between demonstration and riot, between nonviolence and violence, was easily obliterated. As law enforcement officers sought to restore order, police brutality became the cry of the insurgents. The invariable charges of police brutality were hurled as efforts were made to maintain law and order. When marches and demonstrations turn into riots in any country slated for takeover, the communists are then ready to implement the final stage of their blueprint for conquest. It takes only a handful of armed opportunists, criminals and savages, to create the semblance of revolution. Only insurrection can guarantee the victory of the revolution. The purpose of insurrection must be not only the complete destruction or removal of all local authorities and the replacement by new, but also the expulsion of the landlords and the seizure of their lands. And so it has been, with but minor variations in one country after another. Divide the people. Create the appearance of popular support. Neutralize the opposition. Precipitate mob violence. Create the semblance of a revolution. An accurate summary of Lenin's strategy for the conquest of the world is as follows. First, we will take Eastern Europe. Next, the masses of Asia. Then we shall encircle the last bastion of capitalism, the United States of America. We will not have to attack. It will fall like overripe fruit into our hands.